you get this. And I want to share my screen with you for just a moment. And after that, we'll introduce our amazing guest speaker today, Charles Lemire. But first, let's uh, go over a couple items. So there's uh, four of us on uh, Eagle City multifamily uh, team. There is Asif Komar. He's on the call with us. He'll be, uh, you're welcome to ask any questions um, after we get started. Uh, we're all here in the Dallas area. And we have Nikki and Sanjeev Mall. Um, they're also in here, here in the Dallas area. And um, we look for uh, B and C class apartments is what we, what we uh, are looking for here in the DFW area and surrounding areas. So we purchase apartments and uh, we do syndications where we open the investment up to uh, individuals like you and I that have the opportunity to invest in these apartment deals. And, um, you know, hopefully double our money, right, in the three to five year business plans. Uh, Charles will be telling us more about how that works and his experience in this um, apartment investing space. And so feel free to uh, chat, put your questions in the chat, or later during this meeting, we will open it up for questions. You can raise your hand or your, make your question known either by you know, raising your hand or raising the little um, electronic hand on the window. Uh, please put in the chat where you're tuning in from today. I'm actually out of town today on, um, so let's jump in here and get started. And I will introduce our amazing guest speaker today. I'll stop sharing here here in a moment. And Charles, you're welcome to uh, share your screen if you care to. Otherwise, just um, hang on and listen to Charles's amazing story. Charles Lemire um, lives here in the DFW area as well. Uh, he is a serial passive investor, currently invested in over 5,000 units apartment units, the total combined uh, apartments, and in 36 deals. So those over 5,000 units are combined, uh, 36 apartment comple complexes combined. So we'll, Charles, would you uh, mind uh, introducing yourself and sure. how you get started and sure. how we can get started? Yeah, I can do my story. I misled him. It's actually, uh, we've gotten into 70 deals total. One deal hasn't closed yet. So if we talk about the 69, 37 of them have gone full cycle. 32 of them are then the ones we're holding. And that's where the 5,000 comes from. But numbers of doors to a passive is sort of irrelevant. I'm going to say that I may own as much as the sawdust that they, they produce whenever they drill that little hole when they stick the, the peephole in that door, that's about how much I own of all those 5,000. So, you know, I don't know that the, you count the number. You might say, well, it's important to know how much you got in all the deals total. And yeah, okay, we got a couple of bucks stuck in a bunch of deals. So what? Anyway, so uh, how did I get started? I'll, I'll start there. My wife uh, decided that her DNA, because her father was played around in real estate a little bit when she was younger. Uh, he passed away far too soon, it turns out. and she felt that, well, if he did it, she should do it. So she went and got her, her license, went to school and everything, sold a couple houses, but quickly determined that working weekends was not her thing, making cold calls were not her thing, and working nights was not her thing. So at that point, she decided and dragged me to one of those lifestyles meetings and got me sort of excited about this stuff. And so we, we, we actually left and came back and then joined. Uh, and a guy named Brad Sumrock uh, taught the class when we joined the on that second trip. And so he talked about single family. I was not interested in single family. I don't like talking to people. I'm an engineer. We like machines, not people. You know, I'm, I'm completely uncomfortable with people, as you can see. I'm very shy. 
And so at that point, I, he started talking about the uh, the multifamily stuff and, hey, it's math. I like math. And so you talk about cap rates and that clicked. You talked about, you know, how you do all the improvements and that clicked. And I went, hey, I can do this. So we started uh, trying to find a deal, invested in a deal. And sort of the rest is history. We got into three, I think, the first year, as I recall, two more the next year. And we just started dumping into it. And then after a few years, we started selling these things. And, you know, I'm just an engineer and I made reasonable money. But all of a sudden, I'm making more money on these apartments than I am on my uh, engineering gig. So I lasted until I was supposed to. Um, it is humorous. Brad will always say, uh, you know, double your money, three to five years, retire in uh, five years. And I went, well, I'm one of his failures. It took me eight years to really retire. So I am I am pretty bad about that. But uh, anyway, we went on from there. And so now, um, you know, TI is where I worked and it didn't lend itself to jumping in as a GP. So I got pretty used to being an LP. When I retired, my wife strongly suggested that I go on to GP and I strongly suggested that I'm way too lazy to do that. LP does stand for lazy person. So I continued <laughs> on that vein and uh, I've been doing it ever since. And it seems to be reasonably lucrative. Uh, you know, I, I will say that uh, it has worked wonderfully. Maybe the last uh, 12, 15 months have been a little bit of a problem because of that interest stuff going on. And I may get my head handed to me, but so far things are looking okay. You know, I, I this, this upcoming year will probably not be the uh, the banner year some of the others have been, but I'm not uh, I'm not in the toilet and I'm not losing sleep yet. So there you have it. And I, I'm hoping somebody's got a question to lead me off on some path. I can do war stories. I can tell you about deals. I don't know. What, what's your interest? I think you were, oh, I'm sorry, you, you were asking me, what do I like to look at to get into a deal? I think that's what your main question was. And I'm going to say you bet on the jockey. And that may sound really dumb, but you know, I, I joined a group, um, same one Herb's in, uh, and a thief, and I can go through a couple more people on the page here. But um, there's a ton of people who are joining all the time, and they all want to be GPs because nobody's uh, uh, like me and, and you know not terribly aggressive and all that stuff. I'm, I'm happy where I am. So they all want to be GPs. And so I try to meet them, and I assess whether or not I want to invest with that person when and if they ever get a deal. And so I sort of make my little list of people. Time goes on, they get a deal. If I have money, I typically look at a deal either way. But over time, uh, I start investing with people that I've met and I have a good deal of respect for. They have a financial acumen. They have uh, integrity, a certain amount of dignity. They're not too slick for me. You know, I have a certain level of I want, I don't want to say good old boys exactly, but I do want people that I can feel comfortable with. And I have invested with many women also just to abate the good old boy. That good old boy includes both genders. Matter of fact, probably all 20 genders these days, unless there's more of them. And it includes them all for all I know. So anyway, get my get my wokeism out of the way here. Um, sorry, political. Shouldn't say these things. Tough. I lean way to the uh, right. So what can I say? All right. So uh, you find a guy you uh, or a bunch of guys and sooner or later one of them gets a deal. And you look at that deal and you go, hmm, this sort of looks good. Or, hey, this makes no sense whatsoever. And some of them don't. You know, they're not your thing. Uh, a friend of mine did uh, student housing. I'm not doing student housing. So that one was not one that I wanted to get into. Uh, a friend of mine did some renovation stuff where he took an office building and renovated it. And I'm a I'm a suburb kind of guy. So when he was talking about getting um, jail cells about 500 square feet, I think there were maybe 600 square feet. I'm thinking, wow, you know, prisoners get bigger spaces than this. I, I just couldn't fathom that. So, you know, it wasn't my cup of tea. So I want to be in things that I can understand, things that I think will do well. You know, clearly, after you bet on the uh, the jockey, you know, you want to be in a place that has good demographics. You want places that have good hiring. They got people moving to the area because Detroit, where people are moving out of, or I don't know, California, but I understand San Francisco's not a great place to own a lot of property in these days. But you want, you know, a, a government that's not against you and you want uh, people moving there and you want good jobs because good jobs lead to good rental income. So, the, I mean, there's a lot of things that go into it. You want to be in the, the part of town that matches what you're you're buying. You know, if you're buying an A-class property and you buy in a dump, that's not a great idea. If you buy a B and a C in a reasonable part of town, that's probably perfectly normal. And so we do buy a lot of Bs and Cs. And I'm hoping that's an understandable kind of concept. You you rate apartments from B to D. 
D stands for the short term for DDT. And you all may remember that, uh, that uh, bug spray from long ago, DDT. Well, this is DDT, don't do that. In other words, do not buy a D property. Um, so, you know, they're the ones where the pizza guy won't deliver. Anyway, the, the, uh, the B's and the C's have a fair amount of uh, return available. You buy one, you try to take it from maybe a, a C minus to a C plus. You try to take it from a B minus to a B plus. Essentially, if you can raise the rate, you end up making money. It works. You get rich. whoop de doo It's a good deal. Uh, and I let the other person do all the work. Again, lazy person. Uh, you know, yes, I know how this works. And yes, I put my two cents in on, on many occasions. But uh, no, I try to avoid doing the work if I can, if I can help it. Come on, put a question up there so I can hit on that. All right. So what else do we want to talk about? Go ahead. Herb. What do you think about, Charles, what do you think about the current market? What is the top three challenge at this time for the passive investors to invest in this I market? Think, I think it is a, okay, the only time you really have a lot of trouble is when the wind is against you, and that's when the interest rates are rising. Now, there's three variables in, in apartments that you really have trouble controlling. Insurance, you know, it goes up whenever it wants to. Taxes, it goes up. And, uh, you know, my conspiracy theory is that the people who fight the taxes pay the people who raise the taxes to raise them higher so they can get money paying uh, that we pay them to, to lower them back down. You know, I think it's I, you know, I think everybody's on the on the graft on that one. And they're probably not. But it sure feels that way. But anyway, taxes are a big problem. They go up and you, you don't have any real control over that. As the price of the property goes up, the taxes will go up when they finally figure it out. And shazam, you end up having more expenses that way. And the third one now is the interest rate, which we really didn't used to care too much about because it didn't move that fast or that much. Recently, it has. So my thought on, on your real question is, you know, yes, we still have some insurance issues. Yes, we still have some property issues. But the big boogabear as of late has been this, this uh, interest rate. But the interest rate's gone up. And it looks to me like we're starting to flatten out. So buying something today, it's not going to continue going up, which is where you get bit. It's going to flatten out, and it may even go down, in which case you're going to have the wind behind you again. At least that's my take on it. There's a lot of uh, thoughts about blood in the water, and there will be people who have to sell. There may be a few of those. I don't think it'll be as, as vast as some people say. I think a lot of people did a good job of buying caps to begin with, so we'll have another year or two. It sort of depends on how long it takes for the Fed and the uh, Biden administration to fight over who wants to cause more inflation or who wants to cause less inflation. But uh, if they would solve the problem more quickly, I'll be saved. If they take forever to, to uh, solve the problem, it'll hurt me in the wallet. And that's pretty much what it is. But if you're buying today, you're already at high and the underwriter's already written at a high interest rate. So, you know, it shouldn't be a big issue. It's when he writes at a low interest rate and you're expecting to make this much and all of a sudden you make this much because, the, uh, the underwriting is flawed. So I don't see it as a big problem today. I saw uh, I see it today as a big problem 12 months ago, but you know that's that's hindsight and it's 2020. All right, we have another question from Adnan Rafiq and he's saying that there is not much cash on cash available in most deals due to high interest rate. LP don't have any tax benefits. So why do people who like cash flow should invest in the multifamily apartments as compared to the new construction? Um, I'm gonna say, I don't think new construction or current multifamily are gonna have a lot of cash flow either way. So. I don't think that cash flow is what you're going to get. My common statement for people I've tried to suggest that they get into it, and I, you know, I'm not going to twist anybody's arm, but it has been uh, very, very good for us. Uh, but it is not a cash flow thing. People talk about all this cash flow, and I will tell every one of them that cash flow is, is vacation money. It ain't eating money or you're going to be real skinny. I've got many deals that never paid a dime during the two or three years they operated but they paid off at the end very, very well. You know, it, it's sort of a, a joke to me. People always go, well, how do I make 10,000 a month? I can't tell you. I have no idea how you can make 10,000 a month. I can tell you how to make a million a year, but 10,000 a month ain't happening. You know, I, I got no way to do that for sure. There's just not the, the cash flow. 
I mean, go buy an annuity if you want guaranteed income. You know, so don't put your last dollar in this. Don't put the money in that you need to eat on. But, you know, in three years, five years, they're going to sell this thing. And it is highly likely that you'll make a reasonable return. That, that's been my take on the thing. Now, as for, you know, new construction, I don't think, I mean, it takes two years to get out of the ground. And if it takes a year before that to get through all your uh, permitting and, and ground preparation and all this other stuff, I may be uh, exaggerating a little bit there. But anyway, it takes quite a while to get the place to a point when you're you're up in leasing. And when you're up in leasing, it sort of depends on the environment at the moment. So you built an A-class property because that's all you can afford to do. And there's only so many A-class people out there. So now you're offering a whole lot of uh, uh, discounts and whatnot to these people who are in the B-pluses to get them out of the B-plus and into the A. And so, you know, it it's not quite as lucrative as you'd like first out of the box, you know, give it some time and it'll start working pretty well. But, you know, I don't see the income being the big benefit. Now you can buy it and hold it forever and it'll work out okay. But, you know, you can't, you can't eat on your income from property from what I see um, up on the first few years. It just doesn't happen. Now I, on the, on the positive side, I've had one that was returning a 45% uh, cash on cash. But that was because they did a supplemental loan. They paid me back a lot of the cash, so I had so much less in it that the you know they paid me a dollar and wow, I'm I'm there. You know, it it, it wasn't that it was cash flowing that much more. It's just that I had been able to take the money out because of these uh, loans that we had on it and put it somewhere else and then start that one working. The highest one I've got right now, I think, is around fourteen percent. You know, but it's it's rare. I've got a whole lot of them that my my distribution is going to the bank because it's a floating floating loan. Thank you very much. So. Uh, if you're not familiar, what I'm really trying to say is they have stopped distributions because they're now paying the bank or they're hoarding money so that they can buy the next cap for the uh, interest rate. Any case, uh, and I'm not I'm not crying. You know, I, I got into this. I've seen so many things happen. You know, you get into this with your eyes open. Uh, you need to be sophisticated to be aware of what's going on. You know, don't do this if you don't know what you're doing, but be aware that it's no guarantees in this thing. How do you retire without cash flow? Uh, last year I made $2 million. Is that a problem? But it wasn't cash flow. It was, at, it was appreciation. So meaning do you cash out at the end of the cycle and use the profits for the next year's income and use the initial? Yeah, I, I, I graphed a little bit off. I have what I call my eating and tax bucket so that I can pay my taxes and eat. And so every year, Hopefully we sell something we have so far, you know, this year might be a light year and some of the money goes into the, the eat bucket. And then I've got uh, stuff in the market anyway that I can, I can run over and grab that if I have to. So it's not a big deal. Let's see. There are tax benefits for LPs. They can take advantage of depreciation too. That doesn't sound like a question. That sounds like a statement. I will say it depends. Um, I feel and uh, if you are a new person, that's not true, says someone else. Well, let me explain it. If you have been doing this, I have been doing this. I sold something last year and I bought something last year. When I sold something last year, I made a bunch of money because it was a, a gain. I took some of that money and reinvested it in something again the same year. I got depreciation, which made my gain go away. It evaporated, so to speak, until I sell the next place. So essentially, I could hide my gain to pay taxes in the future. There's no getting out of taxes. The, the tax benefits are push it off into the future. Now, if you're a real estate professional, oh, I don't have to pay any taxes. Eh, you know, someday you're going to sell that puppy or you're going to 1031 it or something like that. But someday, you know, the tax man will show up. Now, if you can arrange to die at the right time, you can 1031 it uh, to yourself over time. And then when you die, there's a step up in basis. But I I see the side effect of this thing is you're dead. So, you know, yes, you can get out of that. But same thing's true in a, uh, um, a syndication. I mean, if I keel over dead, my wife will get, you know, my share at a tax uh, a step up in basis. So it, it's not it's not that much difference. Now, I don't have the ability to actually 1031. So the uh, the bonus depreciation and cost segregation stuff that's been going on has made it very, very nice. What I will say is if you don't have any property today, you have no passive income today, and you buy into one of these things, the depreciation is going to sit there. And so in that case, yes, I would agree that that depreciation will not do you much good. 
because effectively all it'll do is return you to start whenever you um, go to sell the place. So it really depends on where you are in the phase of the period. And I'm sorry, but in the, the shark and chum relationship between GPs and LPs, me being the chum and them being the GPs, I'm sorry, them being the sharks, they're going to tell me anything they can to get me into their deal. And hopefully it's a good deal because I'm going to look at that too, but they're not going to worry about it. They're going to say, see your tax due because your, your mileage may vary. You know, you need to know how the taxes work so you don't get snookered into this thing. And so it is true that um, if you're completely new at this, you probably won't see much out of this big bonus depreciation kind of stuff. But if you have been doing it, you will. It's pretty much the way it works. That was roundabout. I apologize if that went all over the place. There's no, it end up paying more on taxes if, what? There's no advantage for LPs. You end up paying more on taxes if you take forced depreciation upon exit. You are sent a K1 with forced, I don't know what the forced means, but okay, you get, uh, you do get depreciation carryover and there is a recovery on it. So yeah, it's true, but it pretty much brings you, you know, you buy something at $100, it goes to $200, you pay a gain on the $100. With depreciation, it says that 100 you paid for to begin with starts going down toward 50. Now, when you sell it, you have $150 in gain. So yes, you get to pay tax on the whole amount. But if you got the depreciation that you got when you bought it, you return yourself to 100. So you're still paying capital gains on the amount. And I will tell you every day that you typically want capital gains over earned income because earned income is almost always taxed at a higher rate unless you're a very low in, a low income maker did i did i uh do i is that ad adnan is that how you pronounce that adnan 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 okay i'll screw up so, every time. i apologize did i, so did there, I what you're saying uh, uh, yeah i think there is a adnan do you want to ask the question directly so we can unmute you yeah that's can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So recently I got out of the deal uh, where I, in four years, uh, it wasn't a good deal. Uh, last Considering last four years, everything went so high. But we made uh, $60,000 on my $150,000 investment. Okay. And I got my K-1 at the end of the exit. Uh, they want me to pay taxes on $87,000 rather than sixty one. dollars and I asked them, why am I paying on 87 when I received 61 in four years, including everything, rental income, capital gain, everything. And they said, because it's a depreciation that the GP got on the deal and the initially, it's, it gets distributed at the end and you, you pay taxes on those depreciation, which I never seen any advantage okay i you know i'm not looking at your k1 what you should have seen and if you don't mind let me say a hundred and that you got back um let's see ballpark it looks like you got back about 150 we'll call it 150 but it looks like it's about 140 in your real numbers just so we can keep the numbers straight so you uh you put in 100 and you got back 150 in your mind i made 50,000 now i'm paying taxes on call it 75,000 is that yeah that like what you're that talking about that's what okay. I'm talking about. All right. But when you got that first K-1, because it lasted for four years, you got some depreciation. Now, I don't know what you did with that depreciation. If you had sold something else, you applied it to that other property. Um, I'm sorry. If you yeah, if you sold something and made a gain, that depreciation caused you to not pay taxes on a prior deal, or you just stuck it in the bucket and it carried forward until you sold this deal, at which point you should have a certain amount of carry forward uh, depreciation that they will add back to your basis and you'll return back to that hundred and you should only pay taxes on that uh, on the 50 if you see what I'm saying there's there's a piece of this thing that slides around the benefit to you is you could use it earlier and therefore allow money to play for longer before you pay taxes but if you didn't use it it should just return you to what you were before and it's it's hokum so if it was the only deal you were in, you, you should just really return to it. Now, your K-1 is going to say that you had 87, but that's this K-1 because your accountant should have a document that says he prior in the past got 
and we'll call it $50,000 worth of depreciation. And he reaches into his pocket and says, ah, I got your depreciation from the past and I'm going to apply it to this deal. And Shazam, you're going to only pay for the uh, actual gain on the property. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like hokey. Well, I'm paying on 87. That's all. I'm not an accountant. I don't understand much numbers. I'm right. Just... But it, do you do your own taxes? I have somebody who does it. Okay. He should have, he should have done a form. I'm going to say it's an 87, I'm sorry, 86, 66 or 86, 86 or something in that neighborhood where you, you put all of your passive uh, property and that form would contain how much you've had. Go back to when you bought the thing and you should see on the first K1 that you got some depreciation. Yes, I, I did see that. And, okay, uh, on, that, on that one, that depreciation, you could have either used it, and I don't know if you're in other deals, but let's say you're not. Then it only, it just went into the bank, so to speak, and you held it until you sold this one, in which case you get to apply that and raise the basis, you know, what you paid for it, the apparent apply your cost basis, you get to raise it back up to where it really was, and then you'll only pay tax on the difference. They're not screwing you, I promise, but it does look like they are um, often, unless you just do bad taxes. If you change accountants, one of the things you can really do that's wrong is the first guy, he has all this stuff stored up on his form, and you go to the, the new guy, and they don't talk to each other, and all of a sudden you lose all of your past depreciation and that can easily happen so you know you need to keep track of that depreciation from year to year okay thanks mm -hmm. i'll take a look and i'll talk to my cpa again okay pull out, pull out the 4k ones and that'll help the two of you talk about it okay i have another question if you don't mind i never mind okay so prior to this deal i invested in another deal with my uh, subdirected ira okay and we got out about a year ago and made pretty hefty return, 168% in four years. Uh -huh. but that was my quest. And that was my IRA. Yes. Somebody told me that now you have to pay UBIT tax. Do you it's know actually, anything? Yeah, it's actually UDFI, which is the ugly step cousin of uh, UBIT. But yes, you do. And it is. Even though it's my retirement account. I don't have, I don't have uh, my, I mean, Quest is my custodian. I don't yeah. see the. Okay, here's the deal. Um, the way the IR, uh, IRA laws are written, and the IRAs come from a certain U.S. code, I couldn't tell you what it is, but they suffer from something called UDFI when you're investing in a property like we do, or if you invest in a business, it's UBIT. And what they are trying to do is make it fair. It's sort of unfair, but they make it fair because you're going to pay taxes at a rate on the amount of money that you made from the leverage. Now, the way to avoid it, sadly, you're past this because they've sold the property, is to move to a solo 401k if you can. There's tricks you can pull to get into a solo 401k. I am a huge advocate of avoiding using retirement money, with the only exception being a Roth or a solo 401k. That one I, I think is an okay deal. But both Roth IRAs and traditional IRAs both suffer from UDFI. Um, un something financed income or something like that. Anyway, the the trick is there, you're going to get to pay a hefty tax on your profits. It is a royal pain in the popo. I think it's crooked, and nobody tells you anything about that. Remember that shark chum relationship. When the sharks are out there, they want your money, and they're not going to really remember to tell you some of these things that are all falling off their mind. You know, and, I, and they're not crooked per se, but, you know, they, they really don't tell you the whole story because they, you know, if you found out about this, you might not do it. But it does come back about two years in, pretty much somebody starts whispering about this and you go, what the heck are you talking about? And Shazam, it is a true statement. The uh, Anytime you invest in a retirement account, it has some teeth. It, it may be this uh, or it might be. And so, I, you know, I'll hit on the other one. If you're talking about a traditional uh, IRA or solo 401k, remember that what you're doing is you're taking uh, capital gain money, the money that you would be paying capital gain tax on, and essentially throwing that into your IRA bucket. And ultimately, someday when you get gray, like this, yes. you will then pull it out under a required minimum distribution, and it will come out as income money. And so, you know, if you're, if you're a failure, 
it will come out at a lower rate. But if you're not a failure, you will, if you're successful, in all likelihood, you will be pulling it out at a rate that's higher than what you're putting it in at. And, you know, so it's not really a great idea. So I'm a huge advocate for um, avoiding traditional units or traditional IRAs and 401ks unless you really know what your tax problems are going to be. You know, move to a Roth or pull it out completely one of the two. Uh, and if you want to invest in property like we do inside of a Roth for a, sorry, a Roth solo 401k, that's, that is the best of both worlds. There's no tax on that, no matter what you do, and there's no UDFI on it or, or UBIT either. So who, who was, sets it? CPA sets it up? How uh, do I no, you just open it. Oh, well, to, to do a solo, you have to have some sort of business interest that you run. Um, you know, I'm an employee. Can I do it? You can, but you have to create some sort of business interest. You'd like a little consulting doohickey. Maybe you play photographer. Maybe mm. you run an LLC of some sort, but you have to come up with some magic to do it. You know, but check with your CPA and see what he will, uh, you know, not I check with two CPA and they have, I have checked with two CPA. I had to change my CPA, but they had no clue about you, but they said, this well, is not your money and you're not supposed to pay taxes before retirement. Yeah, well, that is not unusual in the uh, in the CPA uh, uh, area. You got to find one that knows about property. I had one that I had up and through COVID. She was a lovely lady. We had known her for 30 years and she did our taxes for year in, year out. But then we sort of outgrew her. Uh, I hope that she uh, did well during COVID, but she sort of disappeared off the face of the earth. Uh, I didn't find an ob obituary on her, but by and large, we then found a better um uh, more expensive, better and more expensive uh, CPA. And he has been wonderful. So you got to go out and look for him. I got all sorts of stories about CPAs not knowing anything about UBIT and UDFI. And, you know, maybe you can coast and not get caught, but it with all those uh, new IRA, IRS agents, I'm not sure I want to chance it. I know. I wish somebody tell me and <laughs> I'm willing well, to pay. Nobody. Why didn't you call it in? This is not your money. You're not Why didn't you call to... and ask me? I, I'm always here to tell people this stuff. I'm full of it. I got brown eyes. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Other joke, guys. Come on. A little, little humor there. All right. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Other question? Let's see. What is it? Okay. So, uh, so my point on uh, retirement money, you know, if you put it in, if you put it in at a rate that is lower than what you're going to pull it out, you lose. So do plan on that. And right now our tax rates are as low as they've been pretty much forever. There's one little period they might've been lower. So, you know, just be aware of that. You're, 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 uh, you're setting yourself up to pay higher taxes in the future when you stuff all that money into a uh, retirement kind of thing, except for a Roth. You know, now a Roth uh, solo, if you play in property is okay. If you uh, are doing market stuff, you can stay in a Roth, but, uh, and, and that one's good because they don't have these extra taxes. But uh, if you're trying to play in real estate in the game where you're, you know, rolling these things like we do in the syndications, it, it does become problematic because all every time you sell it, you're going to pay some taxes to that. So I just don't like that. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And these opinions are worth what you paid for. Just keep that in mind. Okay, guys, come on. So think of something else. Let's see. So my other boogaboo, let's see, we did the, we did the thing about, uh, you know, pay attention to that that cost segregation stuff. You know, if you're starting now, it's not going to do you that much good. I, I will warn you, if you're playing in this game, there's going to be a lot of people crying here because as the depreciation peters off, you know, last year was 100%, this year's 80, next year's 60, and it's going to click down to zero. So, you know, I'm going to make a big gain in something, maybe not this year, but I'm going to make a big gain. And all of a sudden, I'm going to have no place to hide that. And I will get the pleasure of paying taxes on that. So, you know, and there'll be a lot of people that haven't been thinking that through, and they're going to get a big surprise when they start getting their tax bill. Now, those people that are real estate professionals, they can take it off of their income, but ultimately they got to sell that property and they're going to get some tax surprises too, because they will not have this uh, huge depreciation piece um, in the near term. Charles Karina asks, what are some good questions or red flags when looking for a CPA? Ask him if he can tell you what uh, UBIT is 
or if you or and HD uh, HDFI because if if they know what those two are then they can do real estate um one of my one of the there's a there's a a code it's a 26 us 469 paragraph G I have that memorized because it's terribly important and what it says for a passive and I'm just a passive I am not a real estate professional but if I divest myself or dispose of a property in its entirety, I'm able to use the depreciation on that property and all of the other properties that year to remove my gains from all the things. And sort of the rule of thumb is your gains unlock, uh, unlock the losses. The losses can then be applied to the gains to make them disappear tax-wise. So, um, you know, it is a huge benefit now that we have this uh, this big depreciation things, but it'll become much less so later. But if you ask them, you know, just ask them a bunch of tax questions on how depreciation works. If they can answer those, then they probably know enough about real estate to make it work. And we have, a, I think last event, we had a CPA here we, who has expertise of yeah. tax, right? So Herb, if you have a number of that person, please share with the chat room. So maybe they can document it. And uh, that person is, looks be pretty familiar with that text. Yeah. Herb and I have a mutual friend who lived out in California. They got into this stuff and their accountant, you know, he came back, he did his first property inside of an IRA. And the accountant said, yeah, yeah, we're going to a conference. We're going to learn how to do that. We'll be able to take care of your taxes. And when he got back from the conference, he says, this is too hard. Go find somebody else. So <laughs> it is, it is. You know, if, if you ski and I'm way too old to do it anymore, but it's sort of like that point at which you can start using your edges and you, you start, you know, coming down parallel and you're no longer doing, you know, you're playing French fry instead of pizza. You know, you remember that if you started out, it was pizza versus French fry, but, you know, so it's a step above just uh, the beginner CPA. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, I, as long as I'm, pontificating here. If you've not done a, a, a full cycle, uh, one of the things that is typical in my world, and you know, there's a huge number of people do this stuff. And I assume that the things I've done are similar to what other people do. So I'll go forward with it. Uh, we'll sell a property. Let's say, um, I don't have one handy here. Let's say I put in $100,000 and we're really, really lucky and we make $100,000. Well, I'll probably get, you know, the 80% of my gain chunk at the end, you know, there'll be some during the way if I'm really lucky, but at the end, I'll get a big chunk of it, but they won't pay you the whole thing. And that last check, it may take three, six months. I think I just got one that was running out to about 18 months as they finally paid that last check. You know, it's sort of annoying sometimes, but it, it does take a fair amount of time to true up the uh, utility bills. There might be an outstanding lawsuit or something like that. There could be some other outstanding things. So it is often the case that you will not see that check for a very long time, which then leaves you with a certain level of suspicion when the check disappears in its entirety. And you go, I wonder, but you'll never know for sure. They don't, uh, it's real hard to chase that down. Um, I think we had, uh, and the last one will be when the capital account, again, back to your K1, you look in the lower left-hand side, when that goes to zero, that means you've gotten the last amount of your of your goodie out of the thing. But if that still has a few thousand dollars on the last one, then you've still got some more money coming to you. But that money may disappear because they got to pay the accountant again, or there'll be other expenses again. I don't know. Sometimes it disappears. Most of the time, you get a check. What do you mean disappear? Well, let's say that a property sold over in Shreveport, Louisiana, and we got our big first big check. And essentially we got one check with all of our money back that we had invested. And then we got another check for the gain that we were going to make the first big check of the gain. And with the statement that there'll be another check coming, well, no other check ever came and they said, we're done. And I'm just like, well, wait a minute, what happened to that one? And I've never gotten a good answer. You know, so sometimes you just don't get a good answer. Yeah. Hmm. And I'm not yeah, saying it's crooked. I'm just saying, you, man, Herb Cup just comes and goes, doesn't he? All right, there he is, the head, a floating. Herb. Herb. All right. Yeah, there's a in the chat. Okay, what we got? Another? Is there? A, yeah. Oh, 
Okay, yeah, for W-2 income, if you don't make very much, there is a $30,000 or $25,000 deal where your uh, passive, uh, passive losses can offset W-2 income, but usually people that play in this game make more than that, so it doesn't really help us much, but it's for the, the guy who owns a couple of rent houses or something like that, and he has to put a new air conditioner or so in there, but his losses can be taken off against the other job he has. Um, it doesn't come to play with us too much, but you can, you know, if you got, if you're low enough in income, and I believe the cutoff is around a hundred thousand, um, you, you start looking at like 20 or 30, 25,000, or maybe it's 30,000 that you can sort of take against that. Um, never been able to do it. Couldn't say much more about it. Oh, the other case, I guess the other case that it can happen is if you're a real estate professional and then you got you know, it's no problem. So hint, if you're going to play in this game, get your, your, you know, your rich doctor or your rich lawyer or something like that, get, get the spouse to, to run downtown, get her a real estate license and get involved in that stuff. And if she does the real estate to a point that gets her to a real estate professional, all the stuff you make comes off your income. You know, you can make it disappear, but there's a limited time on this. I, I don't think it's going to be as lucrative for those people as soon as we lose all this bonus depreciation. Okay, CPA in Frisco is Kurt Ruffle. Oh, that's, that's you, Herb. Okay, I got that. Yes, that's um, our the CPA that was on our call a couple weeks ago. Okay. And you can also view the video of the call, the meeting on our YouTube channel. Right. If you look up Eagle City monty family on youtube okay uh, you can you can watch him talk and you can listen to some of the things he says but give him a call he's he's with a cpa firm in frisco texas mm -hmm. and um it it would be great for uh at least a second opinion to look at your taxes right um uh, if you're you know if all you've got is a uh an ira let's say it's traditional Actually, I guess it could be either way. Uh, anyway, and you want to, and you decide that I would rather get it out of there. Uh, one thing to consider is if you invest with your uh, IRA and then they buy the property and then they, you know, throw everybody out or a large number of the people out, the value of the property goes down. And that's also the value of what you invested. So I take that 100,000 and all of a sudden, you know, six months later, it's only worth 50,000. That would be the moment to get the uh, get the lead and you know discuss it with him before you invest in the property. But to get the lead that the fair market value is down to fifty, and you pull that fifty out and you pay tax on the fifty rather than the hundred. Now it it may sound crooked, but it is actually street legal to do that, uh, and that's one way to get your your money out. Now there's probably the uh, ten percent problem depending on your age. You know the other thing you can do is um, if you convert money from a traditional to a Roth. You can't really touch it for five years, but at the end of five years, you can pull it out sort of like it was a contribution. So you can pull money out that way. So if your intent is to play in property, I tell people, you know, alternative investments, you know, get your get your match at work. I mean, always get your match. That's a 50, 100 percent return. You can't argue with that. But above the match, you know, you may want to be putting that money in a brokerage account with the intent of, of keeping it invested such that you can move it into property at some point. I just feel that uh, the the IRAs and Anon, where'd he go? Anon was having that problem. Um, Ed, Edmund was having the problem that he, he got taken for a ride on the taxes that go with an IRA. And it's a huge surprise. So, you know, just there, learn how the math works and check out the math and do what's good for you, not what's necessarily good for the lead on that thing. Thank you, Charles. Anyone else have any questions before we wrap this up? We'll be wrapping up here in just a few minutes. So uh, please ask oh. any questions. While you're thinking of the question, there is one other way to get money out without paying that 10%. Now you have to be older to pull this one off. So, you know, if you're going to, you know, 59 and a half, you can get past that 10%. You always got to pay tax on the money. There's no way to get out of paying the, the tax on it, but you, whatever you do, if you can be at a lower rate, that's better but you got to pay the tax. So another way to get away without paying the 10% is a 72T. So let's say you're uh, 55, 
yeah, maybe maybe in the mid mid fifties, fifty two, fifty five, you can do a uh, an equal payment plan. And it has to last for at least five years or till you're 79 and a, uh, 60, 59 and a half. I'll get my numbers right. So, you know, if you've got, I don't know, you're older, you, you've accumulated uh, half a million dollars in there, you could arrange for the, the five or six years to pull out $100,000 a year, you know, because it's, it's equal, equally equal payments over a substantial period of time. And that'll get some of the money out and you can move it into an investment of your choosing. Now do realize you got to pay the tax on it. So you're going to have to have some coins somewhere to do this, but it is a way to avoid that 10%. Awesome. Thank you so much, Charles. That's uh, very good information you're sharing with us. Um, anyone else have any questions before we wrap it up? Um, I have a quick question, and I'm not sure how to explain it in the chat. So um, someone had uh, mentioned to me about having, so if you have a 401k and it has money in it, but you're still an employee at that place, you can have an attorney in Texas assign it to your spouse. You will still pay income tax on that money. But if you're wanting to invest, that's an option. Do you, are you familiar with any of that? Or what are your thoughts on it if you are familiar with it? At, at 59 and a half, you can do an in-service rollover. I know about that one. Uh, assigning it to your spouse sounds like you've gotten a divorce to me. But, you know, I'm not familiar with exactly what you're saying. Uh, if you are have long-term working with a company, and I forget the initials of it, but there is a trick. Uh, I worked for TI. And I did not work there long enough that, and I didn't keep a lot of money in my 401k because I learned about this stuff. But had I been working there for another 20 years prior to what to the 20 I did, and I'd had company stock, you know, you sort of think, oh my God, it's gone up like a rocket. I'm going to pay income tax on that. There is a way that you can pull it out, uh, separate the company stock from the rest of your uh, 401k, and only pay capital gains on it. And I wish I could remember the initials for it, but I, you know, it's got a cute name. Um, no, I'm not going to get to remember it, but as for assigning it to your spouse and eh, that, I'm not sure that sounds almost crooked because, you know, a, a 401k and an IRA are individual accounts, not married accounts. They're not, you know, you don't get to change the name on the things unless you die or get a divorce with a divorce decree. Yeah, there was an attorney in Texas that someone in the summer group referred me to that said that they could do it. And it was some, I guess, you know, roundabout way. But I was just wondering if. Oh, never heard of that one. Texas is a little weird, okay. uh, you know, the way we, we do deals. You know, Texas was founded by a bunch of crooks. And so they made it where you can't collect <laughs> money from people. And you think I'm jesting. It's not. It's Sam Houston owed money a lot of money to a lot of people. So that's why some of the rules are the way they are here, where you get to keep your house and your horse and a few other things. But um, um, there is a rule at uh, if you should leave your company after the year in which you turn 55, you have access to your 401k, but you do not have access to an IRA. So be aware that if you're going to get downsized or outsized or laid off or whatever, or just choose to quit. Uh, don't move all your money to an IRA at the, at that instant, because you're going to lose, you'll start to have, you'll gain a 10% penalty by doing it. So there is that. That I got a quizzical overview, but that's fine. No, 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 no. I was looking at the email from the attorney because I was trying to see if there was a term that maybe someone. No, knew, but I, I've never heard of what it. you're saying. So I'll just, I'll play dumb on that one. Not, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. All righty. Well, um, next week's speaker will be Sarah May. Also another one of our partners on one of the deals that we're, we're, uh, uh, managing together and uh, sh they have she has lots of experience has I think 18 or 20 apartment deals several thousand uh, units in total so don't forget to miss you uh, join us on the call next week on next Monday so we're going to wrap this call up and uh, uh, I'll see if is there anything else before we uh 
go to uh, close the meeting. Oh. You're on mute if you want to say something. Where's my coffee money? <laughs> I I don't have good enough Wi-Fi to do my spinning wheel thing today, so oh, okay. I don't right. know how to select. Uh, In that case, select. I don't. Want We'll, we'll jump back in with that next week. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for your timing. See you guys next week. All righty, oh, have oh, a great before, night. Before, before you Wait, disappear, don't hit yes. me up on LinkedIn. Just send me an email. You can you can have her, 